Welcome to the webinar, Wonderfully Made. My name is Melanie DeStefano, and I am a staff member at the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese Center for Family Care, and I also direct the Fully Human Ministry. We'd like to thank Leadership 100 for providing us with a grant that makes webinars such as this one possible. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. We're using a different platform from Zoom called Teams, and you can still chat your questions. So there's a little chat on top um, to select if you have any questions, but just be aware that there's no anonymous um, option. So your email address will be seen. So if there's privacy, privacy concerns, um, just know that I won't say anyone's name who's sending in the question, and it also will not be recorded in the video. No one will see the chat uh, messages when, for the future recording. So let's meet our wonderful panelists. Our first panelist is Jonathan Amy. He received his master's degree in special education from Duquesne University and his supervisor of special education certificate from the University of Pittsburgh. He's worked as a teacher, supervisor, and educational consultant with students of all ages around the world who have autism spectrum disorders, intellectual disabilities, ADHD, Down syndrome, oppositional defiant disorder, and specific learning disabilities. His specialty is in the field of behavior analysis and precision teaching. Jonathan resides with his wife and three sons in Pittsburgh. Next, Nicoletta Livingston is an occupational therapist in the secondary program at the Perkins School for the Blind in Watertown, Massachusetts, where she works with a broad variety of students with diverse needs. She has a particular specialty in cortical cerebral visual impairment and loves collaborating with students and families at the intersection of mental and physical health to support the development of important skills as they work to attain greater independence. Nicoletta attends St. Philip Greek Orthodox Church in Nashua, New Hampshire. And Dr. Amy Tunanidis Pantelis, more affectionately known to me as Dr. Amy, graduated from Youngstown State University with a Bachelor of Science in Biology, followed by a Doctor of Osteopathy degree from the Ohio University College of Osteopathic Medicine. She served as a family medicine physician for many years and then as the Florida Corporate Medical Director for Well Care Health Plans until her retirement in 2020. She has a passion for philanthropy and advocacy for prospective students pursuing medical careers. She is married to Deacon John Pentelis, and they have four children and seven grandchildren. And just so viewers know a little bit about my background, I have a bachelor's in chemical engineering and a master's of divinity from Holy Cross School of Theology. And most importantly, the School of Life. I am mom to Michael Seraphim, who has complex medical and learning challenges. So this topic is um, of utmost interest to me. So we know, um, well, actually, we're told that all human beings are wonderfully made by the psalmist. In Psalm 139, the psalmist in his prayer to God says, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But do we believe we are wonderfully made? Many of us take the miracle of our life, our bodies for granted until something doesn't operate optimally or illness strikes. Most of the time we fail to appreciate how complex our bodies are and how miraculously they function. I began to see this miracle, interestingly, ironically, when I saw, when I started to learn about my son's medical challenges and it became so clear to me that the way God created us is just, I was just in awe of how our bodies operate. So, Let's hear from the panelists about maybe your experiences as professionals, how you have come to realize the miracle of the human body or the miracle of God's creation of human beings. It's amazing to see the complexities of how the body, the human body is created. 
we have so many interconnected functionalities and systems that are so interconnected with each other. Um, however, we can't uh, also neglect the fact that we also have such a strong spirit within us that you know God also has implanted within us that is very important to address as well um, in our both mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. And in doing so, holistic care in, in, in my experience in taking care of patients is extremely important. And I think health for healthcare providers, it's very important to recognize that mind, body, spirit are in synchrony with each other. Go ahead, yeah, I absolutely agree. You know, the connection is like a really invaluable kind of understanding. And and I also, you know, I see this in my students that I work with so closely and then their families, um, that inexplicable kind of connection between mind, body, and spirit. And um, I think one of the most incredible things when it comes to sort of just understanding how miraculously we operate on a daily basis is just the outcomes that I see in the individuals that I work with that are really just unexplainable by any kind of real <laughs> logical explanation. Um, I have one student in particular that I think of often when this topic comes up who um, had a hemispherectomy when he was young, which means a removal of a large part of um, one hemisphere, one half of his brain, essentially. And the way that this young man functions and operates is just absolutely incredible um, to the point where most people w wouldn't believe you if you explained the nature of his brain surgery and his past history. So, you know, there's he's had a lot of intervention and a lot of support throughout his life but not enough to um, really accommodate for um, that big of a change. So, you know, those, those things are just really incredible. And I think that's a major example, but we see it on small scales all the time too, with the, the small skills and attainments that people make, um, you know, given whatever challenges they're experiencing. And it's really incredible. Right. I think we talked a little about this before um, at another time about the neuroplasticity of the brain. So um, I think scientists estimate a very that a very small percentage of our brain is actually being used. But when something happens and there's an injury or an illness and a certain that the other part of the brain can actually compensate and yeah, exactly. um, for what's what's been injured in, in many ways. Yeah, it's really incredible. And Dr. Amy, you mentioned about the the body's ability to heal itself as well. I think, you know, seeing yes, that it's, is it's very important for us to recognize that. And I think um, particularly when we approach someone uh, evaluating them um, medically, but also structurally from an osteopathic perspective, we see that, you know, um, at times there may be dysfunctions. If, physical dysfunctions that may be causing also nerve stimulation <laughs> in other areas or under stimulation or hyper stimulation in other areas that affect organ systems. And in just correcting those dysfunctions, let's say the spine is out of, out of alignment or the neck is out of the neck bones out of alignment. And if those are, are corrected appropriately, then the other functions, the internal functions, functions function more on a regular basis. But when we do make those corrections and help the patient and help them, the individual um, into a much more regular alignment of their body, the way it's supposed to be, then what happens is it allows the body fluids, the body functions, the body's nervous system to heal itself, to, to really repair itself per se. Yeah, and, and what I've noticed as a special education teacher and kind of working in the homes with a lot of learners as well, is that it really, I've seen healing occur when there is the power of a team. And so 
when kids know that they're supported, and I, I work with adults too, but when people know they're supported and there's a group around them, we start to see that the healing effect is, is just magnified. It goes so much better. So teams, the, the, the thing that I've really learned is that teams matter. And the, when you have people around to support you, the outcomes are so much nicer. And to believe in you. Uh, you know, when you know that somebody believes in you, you can go that extra mile um, and not give up. And um, it's also an image of the body of Christ. You know, one member can't survive alone, but together as one, we are healthy. Um, and we all need that. And like you said, Jonathan, we do see it. Like there's so many people that surround my son to help him help his body live its optimal his optimal life help his body and soul live optimally so so okay let's talk a little bit about the the complexity of body functions and what has to happen to simply talk or simply chew eat move our hand from one place to the other to point to grasp or look to let go there's so much that has to happen so much has to be coordinated for all of these things mm -hmm. to do um, all of these things to happen. And and I'm, I think in all of your different perspectives, you might be able to shed some light on that. Well, from the medical perspective, um, it's there. Let's take the, just the function of eating, swallowing, you know, um, not per se, even just eating, swallowing, drinking fluids. Um, it seems like it's such a simple thing to do. But when there is a disability um, or a, a, um, an impairment in that functionality, then the nerve, nerves in those areas are affected, the muscles in those areas are affected, how we chew, how our tongue moves, how we breathe, let alone you know how we swallow, because if you think about it, our anatomy is so intricate and so complex and so wonderful um, that when we eat, we have to watch how we breathe as well so that we don't, you know, uh, aspirate or swa swallow the wrong way. The food doesn't go down the food pipe, it goes down the breathing tube. And unfortunately, you know, coughing and choking occur when that happens. And, and in eating disorders, we see that on a frequent basis. So teaching and working with people to move their muscles more regularly to um, incorporate chewing um, on a much more disciplined basis and helping them, teaching them slowly and repetitively how to, to swallow is very important in their you know, health and well-being as well as their functionality and how they digest and absorb the foods that they eat. Right. I think it was one of those aha moments in my life with Michael when he had, you know, feeding challenges where he wasn't able to eat normally and went through years of feeding therapy and just learning, you know, that was something I had taken so for granted in my life. I didn't think twice about it. It never had occurred to me how complex it would be and just the number of muscles that are in the face that are required and for the tongue to move the food around and for that to all be coordinated together so much there's so mm -hmm. much in innate intelligence that god has put into us into our bodies to do um to to help us operate in certain ways but it's just mind-blowing almost when you when you learn what is needed that's i mean that's a big part of what we do is when we look at our learners and try to figure out where we're going to start we're always looking at the, these movements especially for eating and for talking and you think about what it means to talk and you know our articulators the muscles in our in our mouth our lips our tongue our jaw all of that has to be working in concert and so instead of tackling the whole eating or all of talking, we break it into those parts and we work on just the lips or we'll work on just the jaw. And like Dr. Amy was saying, these repetitive movements that you want to build up lots of practices. And so we'll get our learners really good at just being able to move their jaw around, just being able to move their tongue. And then we start to put it together. 
so that they're able to put food in their mouth and like create a bolus, like a little <laughs> little ball of food, you know, so they're not eating just one Cheerio at a time or one grain of rice. You know, you put it all together. And that's a, a very sophisticated and coordinated movement that needs a lot of practice and a team to really support. And so when we think about it that way, everything becomes achievable. So these, these huge things that seem insurmountable become doable. And that's what we're trying to do is, is let the learners know that they can accomplish these things. Let the families know that they can accomplish these things. And when you break it down into really small achievable chunks and work on those, that's whenever you get really nice, <laughs> nice progress. You know, before Nicoletta, before you answer from the OT perspective, maybe Jonathan, this might be a, a nice time to show that video. One of the things that I really respect about Jonathan is that he will work with anyone at any age. You know, sometimes in the special needs world, services stop when the student turns a certain age. Um, but in in his training of me, when I was to, when he was helping me to run a program for my son, he showed me this video, and I, it was just really powerful to me. So, if you could just tell us some background, Jonathan. Yeah, so this is an adult male in his 50s um, with cerebral palsy, and um, he was having a lot of difficulty. He's uh, in ministry working with prisoners um, and goes into the prisons, and he was having a lot of trouble uh, doing his ministry. He couldn't get up from chairs anymore. He was really struggling to move. And so this first video, you'll see what it looks like for him to try and get up from a chair. And I have the sound off, but you can just see it's really a struggle, very difficult for him to do that movement. Not a lot of confidence, tons of concentration. So what we did, and I'll stop it there. What we did was we worked on a number of movements in the hip, in the knees, in the torso. And then after putting that all together, this is what it looks like about after 98 data points, which this was during COVID, so there was some time off from doing a lot of this, but 98 data points, and you can see the difference. And so no matter how old you are, no matter what level of disability your or challenges you're encountering, with the right program steps, you can get where you want to go. And, and Terry um, really wanted to be able to get up from a chair and do his job, and he was able to with this kind of work. So. So I think that kind of illustrates what's possible. Um, nothing's insurmountable. Absolutely. Yeah. I definitely I resonate with that from the from the clinical standpoint as well. Um, you know, we do a lot of task analysis and breaking things down into pieces and targeting the specific elements of of different activities and tasks. And you know, even in addition to that, I think. You know, there's so many foundational elements that need to be in place to support the, a person's ability to kind of target those specifics. Um, Melanie, would you, would like you mind sharing? Yeah, that would be great. There's a visual that I really like um, that's sort of like a pyramid of learning and development. It helps, I think, break down the elements of the process to kind of get there. Can everyone see it? Oh, perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK. So what I really love about this is, you know, you can categorize if we're talking about eating, for example, up in independent living skills way up at the top. And you look down below and you just see all of these pieces that contribute to it, starting at the very bottom with like our most rudimentary sensory systems and building up all the way through the process. And, you know, as we're targeting these things, we're looking at, is this something that we are working to remediate? Is this something that this person has, um, their nervous system has the flexibility and the capacity to work on these things and to change in some way? Or is this something that we're accommodating for because, you know, there's an absent visual system or, um, in infant reflexes that haven't been integrated that the nervous system probably will not be integrating, you know, into adulthood and things like that, that we're considering, you know, 
in the case of cerebral palsy, gross motor skills are always going to be impacted. So there's just these these elements that we're looking at as we're going through the process to say, okay, I'm as I'm breaking this task down, and from you know as a clinician, I'm I'm trying to say where are the elements that I'm going to help work with this person to target, or what are we going to do to accommodate the task or the environment in some way to support their ability to participate if that is not an option for them. So I really like this visual. I think it helps us understand the complexity of everything that's involved to get um, mm -hmm. into some of those higher level skills. I would add as a parent, this is very helpful. You know, when your children are little, like when Michael was little and I just wanted him to crawl or I wanted him to meet that milestone or if he was having behaviors that I didn't understand, I didn't know what was missing here the, until somebody educated me. You know, as a parent, we just want them to get to this gross motor skill or this fine motor skill, and we don't even realize what has to take place. All of this has to take place for them to get to the point where they can. So I think it helps me to be more patient and understanding that, you know, we're not all born with the same gifts we are all all wonderfully made but sometimes something happens and our bodies aren't working the way and they were intended so to be patient with that process um, and to get that support like you mentioned um, melanie i i know it's a little off of what we practiced but i have um another video that i just um was able to put together that i think might be helpful to show what goes into some of these really complex skills. Is there okay, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, and so this is a boy where um, the family really wanted him to be able to be in the cafeteria um, with all of his peers. And you can see how hard it is to carry a tray, how awkward it is for him, the worry on his face, the kind of the struggling that he is. He doesn't look confident. He doesn't look comfortable. And there's just a plate on there, right? And so we practiced and we systematically built up all of the skills needed to be able to carry the tray and now look. And if you pay attention to his face and the smiling on his face and how careful he is, and it's full of bottles of water, you know, you can just kind of see the face, right? That is a learner. That's pride. That's being able to do something well. And this is what we're going for, right? This is really what it's all about. So, so I just thought I'd share that just to show that no matter what, if you have a plan, if you know where you want to go, you can get there. So break it down into small pieces. Mm -hmm. If I may comment on that uh, video and, uh, and our, our other guests um, uh, comments, I think the two key points that I'm seeing here is the importance of repetition, identifying those skills and movements or the deficits that need to have repetitious um, involvement, um, number one, with that, with that individual, but also the importance of educating the family or caregivers or the other team members that are working with that individual so that they can also help to reinforce those repetitive movements and, and, and really um, galvanize them into the individuals so that they have mastered that. And you could just see that in that little boy's face, how excited he was that he could carry that full tray. Yeah. It's awesome. That's we do that program point. at home. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> and Michael kind of just like <laughs> throws it. <laughs> but he's yeah. getting there. He's getting there. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Nicola. No, I think I think that's absolutely I totally agree. And I think that's a great, you know, way to kind of wrap it up together, those those concepts. And I think it's also important for families who might be encountering challenges with doing things like that to just acknowledge that that form of learning may not work for everybody in the stage that they're currently at. And that's OK, too. You know, there's there are different ways of of going through that process. So, you know, whether it's like that very motor based kind of learning process, which really some people thrive with, or if it needs to be more exploratory, trial and error, self led process too, you know, there's, there's 
massive benefits to that as well. So, you know, if you're in a situation where you feel like I'm doing this over and over and nothing's happening, that's okay. And maybe it means a different approach is needed too. So yeah, I, I absolutely agree though. Having the team and the family as a major part of that team involved in the process is so important. Right. I think um, what I've seen too is that it's a combination of both. So with the, just in my own, even my own walk as a person. So I need repetition to learn a task. Um, but I also need for it to be enjoyable. <laughs> I need to have motivation. And so like the same thing applies for my son. It, you know, and often when we're planning programs, if you hadn't realized already, Jonathan has been a consultant for our family. So he helps plan the programs. He starts with Michael's strength and his likes. So what does Michael like to do? What does he like to play with? How can we motivate and help build skills from, from there? Well, you bring up just an excellent point. It's about the strength. And so if things aren't working, we go back to the program and we look at what's the design of the program and how can we capitalize on what learners, students can do. It's all about building on the strengths. And you can get so much further when you target things that you can do as opposed to looking at things that you want to reduce or get rid of. And so we tend to look at things from a constructional nature, not pathological. So pathological meaning something you're just trying to target a symptom. You're just trying to get something to go away. We look at what can you build on? Where do you start that you can, you can find a strength and build towards? Yes. Money? That's so important for our community, um, for the people with disabilities and, and also their caregivers, because we, and just, I would say in general, because our culture just wants us, you know, is has the super focus on what is missing, what do we lack, what isn't perfect, so to speak. And so we're always so super focused on those things, when instead we've got all these gifts, this mul multitude of gifts that we have, and we don't even see them because we're so busy looking at what we don't have. And that can apply to the spiritual life as well. We can get, if we, you know, the fathers of the church say, if you focus too much on your sins, you fall into despair. So there's a recognition of our limitations, but also a recognition of our gifts. And starting from what we have, what can be done with what we have, there's a reason for us being here how can we fulfill that to the best of, of what our resources allow, meaning the people around us um, and also the other physical material resources and spiritual resources that we have. Absolutely. So, I mean, that kind of leads into what I wanted to talk about next, which is when there is a disability, oftentimes um, it leads to a growth in other abilities. So maybe you could each speak a little bit about that uh, in my experience um, I've seen firsthand um, with a uh, sister who is um, profoundly deaf how her other senses have compensated for that loss of hearing um, her visual acuity is much more keen her scope of visualizing things is much more global. Her ability to, um, her tactile, in other words, the touch sense, the vibratory sense that she has, it is so much keener, it's keener than mine. <laughs> and and it's, it's amazing to see um, what, how she can sense these various things through the growth of these other senses that have compensated for this loss of hearing that she has. Just a quick, quick vignette. Um, we used to have two Shih Tzus at our home with my, my mom, dad, and my sister when they lived together. And um, Irene, uh, profoundly deaf, and but, but, if somebody was uh, at the door or there was noise outside and the Shih Tzus that if you're familiar with those kind of dogs, they're small dogs, they have a very high shrill bark. It's very vibratory. She could feel that something she knew that when they barked, something was going on, something was outside or somebody might be at the door or something was happening that they recognized and she could sense that. So it certainly was not through her hearing, but 
the good Lord gave her a, a really, really high acuity in other senses to, to see that. It's an amazing example. I see very similar things, obviously, in a school for the blind, we have students who, you know, their vision is impaired or absent. And, and generally speaking, you know, these students have multiple disabilities and some are deafblind and things like that. But for the most part, you know, it's really incredible to see the auditory sensitivity that our students have, the musicality that a lot of them have, um, the musical talent at, at our school is just un unbelievable. If you ever are interested, if you look on the Perkins um, YouTube pages or any social media, there's all the students' concerts and things are really impressive. Um, but one thing I think is really fascinating is I, I um, work specifically with cortical visual impairment, which is a brain-based visual impairment. And um, one of the most fascinating things about it is, you know, your eyes are seeing, your brain isn't necessarily processing what your eyes see. And there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, but one really interesting characteristic that a lot of these people share is something called blind sight, where, you know, they're not function, they're functionally blind in the sense that they're not able to utilize their vision in a functional way. Um, and a lot of times have very limited, you know, functional vision awareness of what's in their space, but can avoid obstacles, can avoid, you know, things in their environment, um, have just this awareness and attunement to what's happening around them. And it, it's a phenomenon described in the literature called blind sight. It's a really incredible. Uh, but yeah, it's, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, where our brains can take over for a lot of things that we're, we don't expect them to be able to do. And then there's also just that sort of miraculous piece where there's not really a good explanation for it, but it's amazing. God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I've seen very similar things, you know, and there's if there's if there's something that once again, you know, pathological, if, if I have a learner that's visually challenged or, or deaf or physically challenged, I'm not looking at those as deficits. I'm looking at what can they do. Um, we also work with victims of uh, victims of stroke. Um, and so how do we get movement back in those limbs? And if we think about it like, oh, well, th those limbs don't work anymore. Yeah, but there is another limb that does, right? So if they have you know, partial side paralysis, we'll use the strong side to support the weak side. And we'll do things like hold on to a bar and raise the bar over your head with both hands. So the, the strong side is supporting the weak. And then they learn <laughs> to do it. And then they, and they feel what it means to move again. And then miraculously, they begin to, to get movement back. And so those are the types of things that we look at. We focus on the strengths and, and go from there. I, I've seen it in my child as well. So Michael <laughs> does have a lot of you know, physical disabilities, one being that he's nonverbal, but he finds ways to communicate with very slight motions, just a couple of pointing and getting like for instance he loves to go to church so he'll bring me my skirt <laughs> so that we can go to church or he you know if he wants he will use his ipad communication system to request certain people but a lot of times if i'm not listening to that to get the point across he'll bring me objects to show me so he finds other ways to communicate um, and i also have seen spiritual gifts in him there's something about when the body is humbled that allows God to really work through um, the person. I think Michael is probably one of the most authentic people I've ever known. There's no guile, there's no pretense. He doesn't know how to imitate. It doesn't come naturally for him. So he doesn't know what's you know appropriate in certain, to be polite in certain situations. Now that could be problematic, but on the other hand, as a strength, I find it refreshing. He's real. He is just so real. And so to me, I believe that's a strength, that authenticity. Um, and I wish I could be a little more like that. But so just suggestions for people with disabilities and their caregivers, you know, what can be done how in the way of therapy or different approaches, medicines, anything at all 
that you would suggest to help us live our full lives to live optimally? I think the team approach is really paramount. Um, you need to have multidisciplinary, um, talented individuals who understand the deficit that an individual has, but also identify the strengths, as Jonathan had clearly pointed out, the strengths in those individuals so that they can collectively work together in concert and also not only help to rehabilitate or improve the life functioning and health and well being of that individual, but also enhance the caregivers, the families, the support givers ability to encourage and enhance that individual's growth. So they are growing together, but identifying that team and making sure that all the components are in place is very important. Um, I, I can go. Um, and so I, I look at, once again, that team approach is super important, but also from a parenting perspective, is that once we kind of collectively look at our own feelings and the things that we're, that we're actually trying to go after too, it's important to recognize what's important to you and that we're getting, as parents, getting access to the things that, that we enjoy. Um, I also have a, a son on the spectrum and it can, be, it can be very demanding. And so if you're, all of your attention and all of your focus is always on your child, then we start to lose track of some of the things that are important to us. Um, and then that can be defeating as well. And so it's important to give some grace to ourselves and make sure that if we enjoy going out on hikes, is it possible to find a way to kind of teach that to our child, right? Or to the people that are important to us so that they can join us on those or just get access to those hikes. Or if it's meeting uh, friends for coffee, or, or watching a, a favorite show on TV, having time for that. So it is really important to recognize that if we're not in a good spot, it's gonna be really, really hard for us to help uh, our children. So I you know, absolutely make sure that that's built into your plan, um, whatever you're doing. That, that self-care is really important. We can get lost, you know, as parent, as if it's a parent or a spouse, you know, we love our family member, and we want the best for them. And sometimes we can get overwhelmed and lose sight of what we need as well. Mm. Yeah, keeping that balance. Yeah, I so, absolutely agree with both of those points. I think having an interdisciplinary collaborative team where the individual, the family is the, the center of that team is really important. I think that you know, finding that meaning, Jonathan, like you're talking about and those important things to us, that's, you know, probably my biggest reason that I love occupational therapy is that it's all about finding meaning and what you're doing and, um, you know, whatever that is. And I think really centering that individual and, and following their lead is just so critically mm -hmm. important because we've talked about, you know, the strengths focus and all these things. And they're, the opportunities out there are just absolutely limitless. There's so many mm -hmm. therapies and methodologies and there, you know, I think people are really mm -hmm. starting to recognize the value of these really holistic and interdisciplinary approaches. And so it really opens the door. And I, I think the most important thing at that point is to just follow the lead of the individual and what's meaningful to them. Um, because we all have ideas mm -hmm. about what we hope for and what we want to see from our students and our loved ones and the people that we care about. And ultimately it really comes down to what's meaningful for them and what's, how do we support their, mm -hmm. their journey to get there? And um, the ways to do that, I mean, there's so many, so many ways to do that, but if we can mm -hmm. support the individual and accommodate the task or the environment in some way, it, it's, it really, it's just absolutely limitless. I would add just a couple of things that have helped us live 
optimally. Um, diet, healthy diet is so important. You know, our bodies need to be fed <laughs> not only spiritually, but physically and not junk. <laughs> and when and when we take in too much junk, um, we just don't operate well. We get sicker more often. Um, and we have this body God gave us. And so honestly, I didn't think a whole lot about diet until Michael was sick. And then I fell to my knees asking God, how do I strengthen his body? And he kept pointing me to dietary um, ways of helping his body to strength, get strength stronger. Um, so we can't under, I, I know it's a sensitive topic because not all of us, we like our food. We want to eat what we want to eat. And sometimes when children get accustomed to certain foods it's hard to take that away or you know but there are ways to just add more good food into the diet as well to help mm -hmm. the body function better and hydration and all of those things but i i also think um like jonathan said that fun is that fun factor is important and to to realize i've been given this so i can do it Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, sometimes I would ask myself, well, Michael can't run, so I don't think I should run. You know, I would feel bad that he was missing out on something, so I wouldn't do it. But then that doesn't make any sense. I run because I can. And Michael can't speak, but I speak for him because I have a voice and God wants me to speak on behalf of him. So as the people in the families who are supportive of the persons with disabilities or illnesses, we can look at our strengths and how do we make our family unit stronger by those strengths? And where do we need to pull in resources where we fall, you know, where we don't have a certain gift um, that we need others help for? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there are any questions. I haven't seen any chat, um, any questions in the thing. I have one more if there's enough time. One more there is. Of, one more thing that I found is really helpful to kind of begin to look at what's important is that we can ask the families that we work with um, if everything were to kind of work out, right? Like if all of the therapies or teachers or counselors or instructors that you have helping you, if all of that worked and all that was successful, what would that outcome look like for you? What would you be doing? And that question alone seems to open up a lot of things for people. They start to imagine mm -hmm. not just like kind of the abstract things like what well, would be happy or would be able to do stuff. It would be what would it actually look like if like a, mm -hmm. if a TV crew were following you around a reality TV show, what would they see you doing? Mm -hmm. And that helps really define things that are important. So I know sometimes with uh, with parents that have a lot of a lot of needs with their children, it's hard to imagine a life outside of constantly doing things uh, to support your child. And so kind of giving some some ways to visualize that's really important. Absolutely. That's a good point. And I, I, I would like to just make a couple comments, Melanie, on um, the spiritual perspective of things, actually. Many times, you know, um, our our children or our family member that that has perhaps a disability is maybe afraid to go to church or afraid to uh, attend um, uh, services or be part of the community. And that's what they want to be, part of the community. And I think part of one thing that we may be missing um, and, and need to work on a little bit more diligently is to educate our presbyters, so our priests, our, our deacons, our bishops, so that they understand the, their, their sheep, and this is a special sheep <laughs> in their flock, and and how do we um, how do we bring them into this this community by helping them to understand the needs of this individual, but also understanding the strengths of this individual as well, and that helps to also educate the religious or the spiritual community, so that they're not afraid or feel like this is something foreign to them, they have a better understanding of what that individual's strengths are and can help to capitalize on that and make the community more rich by seeing 
this wonderful gift that they have in this individual, this special person that is in their spiritual community. And I think, I think that's something that, you know, that's a take home point that maybe we can all, you know, work on going forward and, and help um, educate our, our presbyters and help them to understand and empower them to help empower the community. We'll keep sharing our resources because I'm trying. <laughs> so we have podcasts, we have these webinars. I want to get them into the grasp of get the attention of the presbyters and the elite church leaders too. And some are on this call and some, you know, they're very busy and they have many, you know, but I believe, you know, my husband's a priest as well. When we value every person in the body, the body becomes healthy. Yes. You know, when we believe in everyone, when we all belong, when there's that sense that everyone belongs, then it just flows from there. It, you know, it just is in an ex inexplicable way. Everyone is fed. You feed one, others are fed as well. Um, one sheep. Right. So they're watching. People are watching the leaders as to how they interact with each person and they take their cues, right? And I mean, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Certainly as a parent, I've had to grow into a place where I can accept my child for who he is because I learned to accept myself for who I am. So we all are in this process of growing. So, but like you said, education is important so that more and more people are aware that we really are fully human, even if we may look a little different and might not be able to do everything exactly the same. And really nobody has every gift. Who has every gift? That's really one. That's so a great I, point. Yeah. I want I just, to go ahead, Nicoletta. Oh no, I was just gonna quickly say I think it's it's important also because not only is there a huge incidence of disability among the people who want to be part of a church community and and for whatever reason aren't able or don't feel comfortable, but also like the, the chances of most of us experiencing disability at some point in our life are so incredibly high, and especially mm -hmm. as we age. So when you think about that, it, it's not that this is just like a, you know, for the, for the few, it's really for all of us, you know, because at some point or another, we're all going to need some support in a, in a way that we may not have expected. And having a community and an environment that can accommodate that and support that is so important. They embrace it. <laughs> Valuing each person. I think in close in closing, um, I just wanted to reinforce what I think we've been saying is that look at the strengths, look at the gifts. And I wanted to close with Saint Porphyrius. It's an edited excerpt from Wounded by Love on um, Saint Porphyrius, who is a recently canonized saint on illness. He said. I feel illness as the love of Christ. My Christ, your love knows no limits. I thank God for granting me many illnesses. I often say to him, my Christ, your love knows no limits. How I am alive is a miracle. Among all my other illnesses, I also have cancer of the pituitary gland. A tumor appeared there, which has grown and presses against the optic nerve. That's why I don't see anymore. I am in dreadful pain, but I pray, taking up the cross of Christ with patience. Have you seen what my tongue is like? It has grown. It's not as it used to be. That's also the result of cancer that I have in my head. And as time goes on, things will get worse. It will grow even more and I'll have difficulty speaking. My illness, though I am in pain, is something very beautiful. I feel it as the love of Christ. I am given compunction and I give thanks to God. When I was 16 years old, I asked God to give me a serious illness, a cancer, so that I could suffer for his love and glorify him through my pain. I made this prayer for a long time, but my elder told me this was egotism and that I was coercing God. God knows what he's doing. So I didn't continue with the prayer. But you see, God did not forget my request and he gave me this benefaction after so many years. 
I do not pray for God to take away from me the thing that I asked him for. I am glad that I have it so that I can participate in his sufferings through my great love. Now, I know that's a tall order and he's a saint. <laughs> um, but I think he's the point is that he sees his sufferings as a gift. Not a deficit, but a way to glorify God. And there's a weird thing that happens once you can accept your lot that it does become a gift you know and i'm not trying to minimize the difficulties and the challenges and the pain and the real struggle we each have with whatever our crosses are but with god's help it can be a gift as well with his grace so thank you all for being with us today and um Share our webinar once it's out there. Share it with your presbyter. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.